89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Up next, Terra Verde. Thanks for listening. Basin from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic. Life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Today on Terra Verde, we are celebrating an anthropologist's Thanksgiving. I'm your host, Laura Garzon Chica, and joined by my guests Shannon Randolph and Jason Lewis will take you from the cradle to the cornucopia. As doctoral candidates at Stanford University, Jason, Jason and Shannon have conducted much of their research on the African continent. Their insight into how our ancestors gathered together around feasts and food feasts and feasting traditions. Excuse. excuse me. Their insight into how our ancestors gathered together around feasts and how feasting traditions continue to shape our relationship to the environment today is fitting food for thought for this harvest season. All right, so Jason, how did you end up in Africa? Uh, Thanks for uh, inviting me uh, for today's uh, talk. Um, I got interested in human evolution uh, in general as a kid. I started at 13, and becoming very interested in this, reading books about it, and trying to um, go to college, uh, go to grad school, and, and uh, study human evolution. So um, for over half my life, I've been devoted to trying to get to Africa uh, and do this type of research. So um, starting in 2001... Uh, I began visiting Africa, East Africa, Kenya, uh, afterwards Ethiopia, Djibouti, uh, trying to find evidence for uh, human evolution and understanding how we became who we are today. That makes sense. Must have been an exciting journey. So what would you would you begin to tell us about what Thanksgiving um reveals about human nature, what it means to be human. Sure. Well, um, first, I'm going to just describe sort of overall uh, human the story of human evolution for the last six million years, to put this in context. Um, our uh, The last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees lived in Africa about six million years ago. Um, and at that time, uh, the great apes uh, were just sort of living in a big uh, fruit bowl. Uh, they had a lot of food avail- available to them all the time, and there wasn't a lot of seasonal variability. Food was generally available throughout the year. Uh, our, our early ancestors, uh, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, uh, from about 5 million years ago to 3 million years ago, lived in essentially the same type of lifestyle, in a fruit bowl. Starting about um, 3 to 2.5 million years ago, that situation changed. So before, uh, we know, ch- you know chimps, they go out and forage by themselves. They go out individually, small groups, they eat fruit, they come back to the, the, the nest at night. There's not a lot of sharing going on. Uh, starting 2.5 million years ago, we see evidence of uh, our ancestors. Uh, so this is the beginning of the genus Homo. We have the first stone tools coming in at this time. Uh, and this is also the same time we see an in- increase in seasonal variability. Uh, East Africa begins drying, uh, the the climate changes all over the world, but Africa is especially hit and seasonal variability increases and uh, spatial variability in food resources increase. And so this caused our ancestors, uh, the early genus Homo, to have to go further to find food. And we also see uh, evidence um, through modern analogies that they were probably bringing that food back to a central place and sharing it. 
And so Thanksgiving, the idea of uh, uh, having an abundance of food at a particular time and bringing everyone together to share that food, that's something that really uh, begins in our lineage about two and a half million years ago as in variability in our environment increases. So, so the environment plays a huge role in when and how food is available to us and also what we do with that food. Okay. That makes sense as well. Um, so, Shannon, what is your story? How did you end up on the, the uh, motherland continent? Um, well, thanks again also, uh, Laura, for bringing us on to the show. Um, I, like Jason, actually have had a long time interest in Africa from a very young age. Um, and actually, I do recall something that just came to mind, that uh, image that's probably planted in a lot of people's minds in the early 80s of the Ethiopian child squatting down, lacking food, and uh, a vulture waiting to, to pounce on on the child. Uh, I remember from an early age being very fascinated with Africa and uh, and eventually uh, found my way there um, in college to study abroad. And uh, first it was in East Africa. And I became interested in the connections between uh, humans and the environment um, and began exploring that there and uh, continued on with that when I uh, decided to uh, pursue uh, the Peace Corps in uh, Cameroon. And... Um, and I also got quite interested in the connection between uh, humans and wild meat as a food source. Um, and that is what I ended up pursuing uh, in my um, Ph.D. career. So I, my interests uh, mostly generate around uh, human environment um, connections, but uh, culture plays a huge role in defining those uh, relationships as well. Mm-hmm. Well, these days there's there's so much talk of of scarcity um, in our own world, and um, meaning here in in our here in California, here in the Bay, um, in our circles. But um, there's always been, as Jason was saying, kind of ebbs and flows. Um, some connected to to climate or seasons. Um, but what is it about a time of abundance um, that that brings people together? What have you you seen in in your research? Either one of you. Um, well, I think that there's there's a, a couple of things that uh, define when people bring food together in an, in an abundant level. Um, it can be sometimes when there is a huge harvest that comes out, um, when the hunting season is good, um, which usually falls uh, in the rainy season where I was working, um, and. Uh, and also when you have particular life passages that uh, you want to celebrate, such as marriages or births um, or also holidays uh, or sometimes uh, to praise or appease your ancestors. And so these are times for people to come together and to bring food together. So it's two things, really. It's consuming food in a celebratory way and bringing people together that may not see each other in a normal setting. Mm -hmm. And looking back into deep time, Jason, do you, do you feel that the, the behavior of food sharing is something that distinguishes our species and shaped the species that we, we now are? Yes. Uh, there are essentially two theories that are debated in the literature about uh, food sharing and its importance in human evolution. Uh, so one theory is based more on the environmental side where the food sharing is important just to reduce uh, a group's risk of starvation throughout the year. So uh, if there's a, a food abundant at one time, you make sure you spread that out to everyone uh, so everyone can benefit and hopefully not starve when there's no food. Uh, so there's a sort of risk management idea. Then there's also a much more interpersonal idea and um, uh, one of our professors at Stanford just gave a talk about this uh, this week uh, uh, Douglas Bird who uh, described the idea that food sharing is uh, not only about the calories but also about uh, the person who's sharing the food displaying that person's uh, magnanimity 
generosity, uh, social uh, wealth, you know, the value of that person to the group. And that also reinforces social bonds and displays your, your worth to the, to the group. So we can see two different mechanisms uh, that would be shaping the practice of food sharing in our evolution. I think both of them are, are important, and we're still trying to, to figure out which one uh, was, was the main selecting force uh, in human evolution. Was it more about just surviving, or was it also saying to the group, look, I'm, uh, I'm a provider, I'm, I'm helping out? And it's also about trading off, you know, when you have times of wealth, of, of, of plenty of resources available, then it's, it's more possible to be sharing those, those resources around. Um, and then when it's in times of scarcity, then you kind of have to take care of your own. But if you have been a sharer at other times and you are in need, then you're more likely to receive from your neighbor or family member. Exactly. So what we're really talking about here, it sounds like, is, is reciprocity. Yeah, that's that's definitely uh, reciprocity when, yeah. Now, do you think that there's um, there's a kind of a, let's say, an essential um, similarity in, in um, these processes in, in throughout time in, in human experience in the... the um, sort of the evolution of our species and, and what we see today, what, what people are going to be doing next week when they go to their, their friend's house or their family's house. C- certainly. So my dissertation is actually um, studying a site uh, in France that's a half a million years old uh, where we have evidence of people coming together as a group. We have evidence of fire, uh, suggestive of cooking. Uh, and I studied animal bones. Lots of animals were, were killed and eaten. So we, we start with small groups coming together as often as they can and eating together and sharing. As groups get bigger, we see throughout most cultures on the planet and, and prehistorically uh, traditions of the potlatch or, or some kind of large feast that brings together multiple groups. Once you have gr- you know large groups next to one another, then you have intergroup sharing. Uh, and then today, and, and Shannon's work touches on this, now we're in a sort of a, a global uh, commodity driven world where instead of going out and hunting for a turkey you go and try to buy the biggest turkey you can or or in Africa you know you want to get a special type of bush meat so so this behavior has increased uh, in importance and also changed in in how you go about the the sort of collection of the food and the di- redistribution of it um, and I think another aspect of uh of this Thanksgiving of this coming together is is something apart from the food, which is the social. The food is the thing, the object that we come together toward, but it's actually people coming together. It's relationships intertwining and being reinforced and sometimes even forging new relationships where you bring a new uh, partner or someone into the fold of something that might be a family gathering or a close friend gathering. And so I think that these annual or regular feasts are actually an opportunity to reform or solidify social relationships as well, as well as, uh, as Jason sort of intimated to the, you know, the, the amount or quality or, or size of different types of food or prestige value of different types of food that you might bring to that feast also can act as a signifier to the group of your one your willingness to give quite a bit to that group and two then uh, your relative social ranking within that group so there's different there's different things going on beyond just the consumption of food itself mm-hmm now, I'd like to hear a little bit more specifics about about what you've seen and where exactly you were, Shannon. Um and and then we can we can get into um hopefully the the factor of what commercial or market relations um can can bring about as far as these relationships go when when money um comes into the picture. Sure. Yeah, so so my work has been uh, focused in uh, wild meat or is there sometimes referred to bush meat markets and uh, the consumption of this bush meat in uh, 
urban Central Africa, particularly in the city of Yaoundé in Cameroon, which is the capital city. Um, and this bushmeat can include anything from a porcupine to something like a squirrel all the way up to uh, large mammals, and including gorillas, chimps, elephants, um, buffalo. And uh, so there's a wide range, and um, and you have people who are consuming this in urban Central Africa as as they might consume any other meat source because of economic reasons. Um, but what I found was unique in the Cameroonian context is that uh, actually domestic meat is generally cheaper than uh, the wild meat options. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there's something else that's going on driving most people to consume is what my assumption was when I went in to look at this. Um, but uh, what I found is there still is that wide spectrum. There still still are poor people uh, purchasing this type of meat, and um, and uh, wealthy people also purchasing um, crocodile and uh, these high value rare meats like like a gorilla occasionally or an elef- elephant meat, and usually that would be uh, for a special event. So not something necessarily uh, just like Thanksgiving because you don't have Thanksgiving, but uh, another special event, a wedding, um, you know, like a politician might want to purchase uh, some very rare meat to display at his daughter's wedding to show that he had the capability to buy this and to access this. Right. So food sharing in that context becomes politics yes. in a sense. This is Tara Verde, a weekly environmental talk show on 94.1 KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, or KFCF in Fresno. On our show today, we're exploring Thanksgiving through an anthropological lens with Jason Lewis and Shannon Randolph of Stanford University. And what we're starting to talk about now, it sounds like, is potentially perhaps a case of over-harvesting, over-hunting. What is the ecological impact? Um, This also applies, of course, to Jason's work. and, and the history of humanity uh, in, in more deeper contexts? Uh, well, it, it's very interesting. Um, the, the human consumption of animal products, as I mentioned, probably really intensified two and a half million years ago. And by around two million years ago, we also see the first uh, humans leaving Africa, which means they're expanding their range. Now, why would they be doing that? They might be doing that because they're uh, pushing intensely on the resources in a particular area and therefore have to either leave that area or they're pushing so hard, they're reproducing so much, the the population increases and has to spread to new areas. Uh, also, this is an interesting theory that's been proposed by uh, Professor Foley in Cambridge uh, that they were accessing meat by scavenging from other large carnivores. And so they were end up uh, following the ranges of carnivores such as lions or leopards um, and expanded uh, out of Africa that way. So we see intensification. We see expansion of, of human ranges. And then, of course, the, the most uh, extreme and classic example uh, in human evolution of um, pushing too hard on resources is the idea that about 15,000, 10,000 years ago, um, humans caused megafaunal extinctions across the globe. Uh, this was also the end of the Pleistocene and the beginning of the Holocene, so there are important climatic and environmental changes going on at the same time. So we're still debating uh, whether uh, the, the large uh, megafauna extinction is caused strictly due to human hunting and overhunting or a combination of pressures that cause not only humans to become more intensive but also change the environment to to essentially cause the weakening and extinction Mm -hmm. of those species. So we know that this is a problem that, you know, we are constantly pushing the bounds of resources, but it's difficult to say something was caused by one species or one thing or another. So we're in a constant relationship with the environment. Uh, So if we push hard, it might push back. And if if it pushes hard on us, we're going to push back too. And I think one thing that Jason is uh, hitting on is... uh, is the the tragedy of the commons you know this this theory it was developed by uh eleanor ostrom and um and the idea behind that actually links to what i've been looking at where uh you have uh you have an open resource um such as 
uh, wild meat, or you could take uh, any open resource like timber or mineral, a natural mineral like coal. Um, and uh, if if it's openly available to the public and there's no sort of checks or regulations to uh, to regulate the exploitation or harvesting of that resource, then you can see then then the trend for an individual person is to exploit as much as possible because their neighbors are going to be exploiting at the same rate or faster and and the person who just stops saying we need to save this resource and conserve it is going to be left behind and is going to lose in that battle and so the problem that you have with uh with uh with harvesting timber or any of these resources where you don't have checks on it is that they can go extinct without you even realizing what's happening because uh because there's no there's no uh check to see how much is being harvested and um in in the case of Cameroon where I've been working you have uh laws that state how much you, they have quotas on the number of animals that can be hunted each year and their seasons, but they're not respected. Um, there's a lot of negotiation that can go on between uh, law enforcers and uh, traders of, of wild meat. And um, and so you see that there's uh, there's just this unchecked exploitation. Mm-hmm. And, and you're I, talking about some pretty endangered species. In, yeah, in I mean, case, it covers right? it covers it covers the range, like I was saying before, of of pretty common rodents and and small dikers, which are like a very small deer, um, which reproduce pretty quickly, and so it's not it doesn't put as much pressure on their populations to be hunting them mm-hmm. at unchecked levels. I would say as much. It's of course uh, possible to to drive almost any animal extinct if you put enough pressure. Right. But then you also have uh, the possibility of hunting um, of hunting very endangered species like our great apes and um, and our megafauna, which are which are um, don't reproduce very quickly. Right. And you've actually seen the the sort of maybe the more threatened or the the charismatic meta- megafauna that were of concern in the um, prehistoric context and also in in current days have you actually seen these these animals um at the marketplace as as butchered you know pieces available for consumption yes i have yes um uh, a lot of times i uh, you see those uh those very uh high profile high prestige and high risk uh animals on sale under the table, literally, or mm. uh, in a back storeroom of a market that otherwise sells everything openly and sells primarily wild meat, or you see it even being sold outside of the market in a different location, or uh, more often than not, it usually passes through the hands of private uh, vehicle operators, and uh, people are using cell phones to to make this trade move. Um, so... Looking at that at the at the urban level, uh, it's it's actually very easy to get your hands on something like a chunk of elephant meat. Um, it's just placing a call to a certain person who places a call to a trader in a local level, and then sends out hunters with ammunition and and the guns and some food, and they go get what you want. Um, but one of the things that I thought that was also interesting was. Uh, look looking at a little bit of a comparison between um what's going on in that context and what's going on in this context in here, here in the united here states here in our world yeah yeah i mean we were talking about this before the show started with uh the industrial and the corporate aspects of our food production and uh you know it's very easy to sit here and point fingers at people who are going out and hunting chimps and gorillas and say that is terrible it should stop and to understand it in its context, I think it's really helpful to look back at ourselves and see what we're doing and what kind of pressure that has on our environment. And, and how much do we really know about the food that, that we put out on the table yeah. at Thanksgiving or any other meal? Exactly. I mean, if you go buy your Libby can of pumpkin you know, innards to make your pumpkin pie up. Where did that come from? Who is Libby? Where are they getting these pumpkins <laughs> from? Good question, I mean, indeed. I've worked in uh, turkey farms uh, as 
as a youngster, so I know the conditions uh, inside those facilities and and uh, what those turkeys go through. So uh, it's it's pretty intense um, the the living conditions of the animals and then how they're uh, killed and, and processed. So it's important to learn about that. All right. So it sounds like what we're talking about here is is a, a very deeply ingrained and absolutely essential behavior, which is food sharing, that we continue to engage in happily today. And yet, at the same time, the other side of the story is um, as our populations grow, as our resources dwindle, in fact, we're kind of eating our own um, root sustenance. Well, uh, the the problem goes back to the question of if is, if is food sharing just about staying alive or is it about expressing something much deeper to others? If if food sharing was just about staying alive, I think we could do a pretty good job uh, with the food that's available on the planet. There wouldn't be much resource, uh, dim, uh, you know, diminishment over time. But if we're constantly trying to have more, not only to eat more ourselves but to give more to others to, to show how awesome we are, right. then we're going to constantly be pushing the limits of that resource. So we need to find, uh, maybe we can do this, maybe we can't as a species, but maybe we can find another way to express these qualities we're trying to express by, by sharing food in another way. I, mean, I think Jason's really linking on to something essential, this minute word of the program here, right. uh, for the future of this planet and for humanity. I mean, the the behaviors that uh, that 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 corporate uh, advertising are able to affect are are astounding. You know that you're able to to make someone think, I really need to have this big car. I really need to have this type of new electronic item. You know, and you and you really start to think, I need to have this, and you see other people around you having that. And it's it's a similar thing with what do I need to be eating? You know, even in this era of people becoming more knowledgeable about their food and, you know, we're still consuming, you know, that someone who wants to be a healthy eater is consuming their fresh coconut imported from Thailand. Yeah. How sustainable is this? This may be good for your body, but yeah. we have to balance these things. And I think that Jason's right, though. It's not just about, you know, selling this idea of health. It's actually about, like, really saying, what are people, why are people doing this? And if it's to gain social status, then we need to find something else that you can replace that social status marker with. Yeah. Uh, if you know, if food sharing uh, evolved in our history as a way to deal with variability in food availability, uh, that's understandable. But now, in you know, in the Bay Area, it's not like there's a period of the year when we can't go into a grocery store and get whatever we want. Mm-hmm. And so, having a Thanksgiving tradition about bounty and sharing. Um, in, in our society is a bit it's a bit strange uh, we need to kind of refocus what what that's about yeah we, sh- we should think about it and uh, we'll leave you with that and I, I do hope that you enjoy your meal next week all you um, kind listeners um, but think about our ancestry and, and what we're doing on this planet many thanks Jason and Shannon for coming in to Terra Verde today Join us again over lunch between 1 and 2 in the afternoon on Fridays to hear more about the unfolding future of the planet On Saturday, December 4th, will be a very special event to benefit the International Solidarity Movement's Tristan Anderson Fund. Tristan will be there, and his photographs, banners, and patches from his activism around the world will be on display as an art show. We'll have music with David Rovix, a presentation by Eric Drucker, and dinner will start the evening at 6 o'clock at Berkeley's Unitarian Fellowship at 1924 Cedar Street. Program follows dinner. Come support Tristan, a local activist and photojournalist critically wounded by the Israeli military during a protest against the apartheid wall in the West Bank in 2009. Info at 510-547-7486. It's wheelchair accessible. Donations at the door. That's December 4th for Tristan Anderson and Anarcho Spective.
Good afternoon. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, or